and sovereign. On the afternoon of October 15, 1993, John Willison climbed aboard his single-engine plane for a routine flight. He didn't know it at the time, but his life was about to change dramatically. An experienced pilot, John had logged hundreds of hours of flight time. Today, he would be towing an advertising banner behind his plane. But when he flew the plane low enough to pick it up, he missed. The plane went into an accelerated stall. One look at the altimeter, and John knew that he was seconds away from plummeting to Earth. I knew if I had a stall, uh, things were going to happen awful fast. He quickly tightened his shoulder harness, and that's when he experienced a series of events he will never forget. All of a sudden, I heard in my headset, John, everything's going to be all right and just a tremendous peace came over me. As I was headed toward the ground, all of a sudden I see two people standing on the ground, and I thought, I don't want to hit anybody, and how did they get out here uh, over on the east side of the airport on the grass? I thought they were people, and then just before I hit the ground, I mean, I hit right where they were standing, I realized that was celestial beings. That, that's when I realized that, that there was uh, a presence there to uh, catch my fall. And, and I mean, I actually hit the ground totally at peace. Eyewitnesses estimate that the plane crashed at more than 70 miles per hour. The impact ruptured the main fuel tank and the aircraft immediately burst into flames. And then John saw a vision, what he can now only describe as an angel. And I remember looking up and going all the way up and going, wow. And he had on a tunic looking outfit and had long blonde hair. I couldn't see his face but it was an angelic being standing there. And I remember thinking, why is this fire not touching me? And then all of a sudden, smoke started coming inside the cockpit and started filling up the cockpit where I couldn't hardly see. I look over here and I see a face. He started breathing on me, just breathing. And I remember leaning forward to breathe his breath uh, because I would think, why am I not choking? This is pretty strong smoke in here. We're talking seconds from the time they rolled me out of the airplane and we got away from that plane. All of a sudden, that plane blew up. And I mean, it was, it was a towering inferno. And I remember stopping and looking at that and thinking, I am alive. I remember sitting there on the ground thinking, I was just seated right there where all that fire is. And I'm alive. The Bible describes angels as supernatural beings that are great in power. But notwithstanding that, they perfectly admit to and submit to the sovereign authority of God over their lives. And that's a powerful proof because whenever you have a kingdom of subjects who are as numerous as the stars in the heavens and who are themselves incredibly wise and powerful, and yet, without an army or security force to enforce the king's decrees, those subjects nonetheless perfectly and completely obey the will of their Lord. Well, it certainly argues that their Lord is an absolute sovereign. And that, of course, describes the angels. Now, we know from Scripture that there are two kinds of angels. There are the elect, or good angels, as they're called in Scripture, and then there are the fallen, or wicked angels, the demons. And both, strangely enough, testify to God's sovereignty in their own particular way. Now, the elect, or good angels, testify to God's sovereignty by their ready and willing submission to do any service that their Lord is pleased to appoint them to. They are His glad and willing messengers and enforcers in this lower world that you and I call Earth. And scripture after scripture shows that these elect angels 
Despite their huge numbers and incredible power, literally jump at the Lord's commands. He sends them on his errands. They negotiate his affairs among men. They reveal God's purposes to who he wants, when he wants, and they even act as his reapers and executioners of judgment. And in each case, their ready, prompt, and complete obedience testify to God's inarguable and complete authority over their lives. But of course, that raises the obvious question. If the good elect angel's obedience argues in favor of God's sovereignty, then doesn't the evil fallen angel's disobedience argue against it? Not at all. Because even though the testimony we get from the fallen angels does not come from any goodwill or love on their part, yet in reality, their lives are just as strong a proof of God's sovereignty as the lives of the submissive angels. And think about what I'm saying. Demonic beings are enemies to God. They are as proud and as squarely set against God and His purposes as any beings ever could be. And yet, despite that, they're overwhelmed by the majesty of God and compelled to submit to it whenever it suits God's purposes for them to submit to it. Otherwise, God leaves them to their own natural evil ways. And that too accomplishes God's overall purposes. So good or bad, it all becomes part of God's master plan. In either way, even Satan and the demons know that they can only go as far as God lets them go. That's why we see in Genesis chapter 3, that when the fatal sentence on Satan was pronounced by God for seducing our first parents, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden, Satan didn't so much as open his mouth to respond. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And several chapters later, we have Satan presenting himself before the Lord to give a full account of his actions. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. So even Satan had to report to God. And do you remember the rest of that story about Satan's force control found in the book of Job? In order to even touch Job or anything Job had, Satan needed explicit approval by God, an approval he dared not vary one inch when he carried it out. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied, a man will give all he has for his own life. But stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well. Then he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So the point is, demons may very well be disobedient, but even in their disobedience, their lives testify to God's sovereignty because they can only go as far as God allows them to go. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. And think about the many times in the Gospels when Jesus, merely at the speaking of his word, showed utter and total dominion over Satan and his demons. Well, the demons wouldn't even so much as enter the bodies of a pack of pigs without first getting permission from Jesus. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. 
the demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He, Jesus, gave them permission. And the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. In fact, so complete is God's sovereign control over even the fallen angels that God even made them subject to the apostles. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. The bottom line? Well, the bottom line is this. Angels, even wicked, rebellious angels, testify loudly and clearly, God is the absolute sovereign of all things. Nothing happens, good or bad, without God's full consent. Well, for now, that's about as far as we can climb the steps of Scripture that lead us up to the inevitable conclusion that God is utterly sovereign. But please, keep in mind, we've only just begun. We've only really scratched the surface of the scriptures that prove God not only can act in ways that overrule all things simply to accomplish his purposes, but that he actually does. So in our next program, we'll look at another whole class of scriptures that will take us even farther and higher in our climb towards this absolutely amazing and majestic attribute of God. But until then, may God bless you richly with his sovereign grace and mercy. Simple.